Hey, what's up, 8th graders? This is Miss Ludwig. Today we are on page 8 in your Oceans Lab notebook, and we are looking at the intertidal zone. If you remember, um, the word intertidal actually means between the tides. So we're looking at the area, um, might be near a beach, depending on where you are, but um, from the area from where the highest high tide comes in, all the way down to when the tide goes out and the water kind of seems further away, which is down to the lowest tide. So um, all of these areas in between are the intertidal zone, and there are lots of different organisms and actually different habitats within that very small area. So by the end of these notes, you should be able to explain different characteristics of the different habitats in the intertidal zone. So the first part of the intertidal zone, actually, let me point out again. So if we're at the beach, we're standing on the beach here, and we go in, down to the continental shelf um, here, just the small area right here is the intertidal zone. So it's really not a large area. It's from, this would be the highest high tide when it comes all the way up. And then when the tide goes out, we would call this area the low tide. So the first habitat we're going to talk about in the intertidal zone is called the rocky shore. As you might have mentioned, or might realize or think, the rocky shore is very rocky. Um, so there's a lot of organisms that kind of attach themselves to the rocks, such as barnacles and rockweed and different types of algae and chitin um, that are going to attach themselves to the rocks, um, and they live in that area of the intertidal zone. So they actually have to be... Um, ready to withstand a lot of different changes in the rocky shore area. So they have to be able to tolerate waves. The, because they're in the high and low tide area, when the tide comes back in, the water crashes up on these rocks. So those organisms need to be able to either stay attached or stay where they want to stay when the tide comes back in. They need to be able to survive when the tide goes out because these organisms out here, when the tide goes out, they're kind of left dry. So they need to be able to tolerate the air. But then when the tide comes back in, the water will call, come all the way up to the high tide. And so all of these organisms here will be covered in water. So they also need to be able to survive in that kind of environment. Um, they're also going to have to tolerate changes in salinity, which again means the amount of salt in the water, and also the temperature. Um, because as the tide goes out and there's less water and maybe it pools up a little bit, that um, small amount of temperature or small amount of water, the temperature is going to rise when the sun is beating on it, um, which causes evaporation and makes the water saltier at that period of time. So again, all organisms that live on the rocky shore have to be able to withstand all of these different environmental factors. These are a few pictures that I took. Well, um, my family went last year, last June, when school got out, we went to Washington State, so on the west coast of the United States. Um, and this is on the Pacific coast. And these are some examples of pictures that I took on the rocky shore. Um, this picture up here, I wanted to take just to show you how big some of these rocks are. I mean, this is my daughter and she's in fourth grade. So she's probably four and a half feet tall. And this rock behind her is huge. This is part of the rocky shore. It truly is rocky. And again, this picture out here is showing where the water comes in. And we were walking on the rocky shore at low tide. So all of these rocks and stuff were exposed, but when the tide comes back in, all of this rock gets covered in water. Um, a couple of pictures that I thought were pretty cool. This is one big old boulder that has some example of some rockweed on it and some barnacles that are attached. This is a closer up picture of some barnacles and this green stuff is something they call sea lettuce. <laughs> um, it's kind of slimy algae like type stuff. Um, and then here's just a closer up um, picture of that rockweed, or sometimes they call them sea sacks. Um, if you step on these things when we're rock walking across the uh, big huge rocks here, so they would like pop and kind of squeeze out some water that they were holding on to. Um, but yeah, those are some examples of the rocky shore. So the rocky shore is going to be up the higher part of the high tide area. The second type of habitat we're going to talk about are tide pools. So when that tide goes out, when the water um, leaves, in those little crevices between rocks, we end up with these kind of small pools of water, and we call those tide pools. Um, so in a tide pool, the organisms have to be able to adjust the changes in temperature and salinity, as I mentioned before. Because when the tide goes out and we just have a small area of water left over, that water is going to heat up very quickly when the sun shines on it. And when that water heats up, the water is going to evaporate, which leaves behind the salt. So the water, the salinity, is going to be higher um, when the tide is out and that water has been um, evaporating all day. 
This is a really pretty picture of some examples of types of organisms that you would find in a tide pool. Um, you see lots of the sea anemones, sea urchins, um, sea stars or starfish, um, lots of types of organisms like that. These are some examples of real tide pools that I saw, again, on the Washington coast. So this picture down here is an example. So these are our big rocks on the rocky shore. Um, and then as you can see, that's left behind in this kind of groove, just some water kind of got left behind. And that is what we're looking at in the tide pool. Um, again, we see a lot of barnacles and that kind of stuff attached to the rocks, a lot of that um, rockweed type stuff. This is an example of a different tide pool where we saw some really cool um, aggregated sea anemones right here. So these pink and green looking things and they're actually different, um, lots of different species of them that we went and saw. Um, and this is an example of something called chitin that a person that was there um, explaining the tide pools to us pulled out of the water to talk to us a little bit about, but just another type of organism that you would find in a tide pool. The next type of habitat in the intertidal zone is an estuary. So an estuary is a coastal inlet or bay where fresh water mixes with salt water. So basically, um, in this picture here, you'll see the same picture on page 10 in your lab notebook, and there are a few questions you're going to have to answer about estuaries. So an estuary is where we have fresh water, so we have a river which has fresh water, which means no salt, and where that meets the ocean, um, you know, the ocean is salt water. So in this area in the middle here is where we're going to find estuaries. Um, because the fresh water and the salt water mixes, what we find in between kind of half and half-ish of fresh water and salt water, we call that brackish water. And you're gonna need to remember that term for brackish water. Um, an estuary is an example of a type of wetland. And we've talked about wetlands earlier this year. Um, so estuaries are really important to, for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the reasons that estuaries are really important is because they are one of the most productive ecosystems on Earth. Um, because we have fresh water from rivers coming in and bringing all the nutrients and stuff from land, um, and then we also have that mixing with the ocean water, the salt water in this area, um, it allows for a lot of different plants and organisms to live. Estuaries are also really shallow, at least in North Carolina. Um, here in North Carolina, because we're a coastal state, we have a lot of different estuaries. Um, and the water is very shallow in our estuaries in North Carolina, which allows the sunlight to penetrate all the way to the bottom of the estuary. And we know that sunlight allows photosynthesis to happen. So because the water is so shallow, we can grow a lot, a lot of plants. We have great biodiversity. Remember, biodiversity means differences in life. So we have a lot of different organisms that live here, not only um, water organisms, but also a lot of birds and, and terrestrial organisms that visit estuaries. Estuaries are great nurseries for organisms to lay their babies or hatch their eggs and grow um, any kind of smaller version of the organism so they are protected um, before they are sent out to sea to live. Um, Estuaries, just like other wetlands, are very good environmental filters because they have a lot of plant growth um, and because they have the fresh water coming from land, there might be pollutants from humans or other um, circumstances. And those plants in that water area kind of helps filter out. It's a natural filter for pollutants. And these are some examples of the types of organisms you would find in an estuary, living in the water at least. A lot of different types of fish, shrimp, different crabs, clams, oysters. Um, and oysters are actually a really good way that um, estuaries filter the water as well. I've read somewhere that they filter, I can't even remember the number, but an intense amount of gallons of water um, just in their life process. They naturally filter pollutants out of water. And this is a picture I just kind of wanted to show you. Um, this is Pamlico Sound. So we do have a lot of estuaries in North Carolina, but Pamlico Sound is the largest estuary in North Carolina, um, and it's up in the Outer Banks area. Next, we have a salt marsh. Again, another type of wetland area. Um, salt marshes are a lot grassier than estuaries. So they have, a lot of times they stink too because of all this vegetation. Um, if you were to step on one of these areas, they're probably pretty squishy because again, it is a wetland area. A lot of times it gets a lot of water. Um, 
but some of this plant matter starts to decay over time and um, become it makes this really stinky kind of smell. Um, but we have a lot of nutrients because of all this decaying plant matter, which allows um, for a wide variety of organisms, again, and a nice little food web. Again, in these wetland areas, it's not just organisms that live in water that live here. Um, as you can see, we've also got different types of turtles and otters and um, birds and stuff that visit the estuary and don't necessarily live in the water. So it's a good connection between those um, those aquatic and terrestrial food webs, those land and water food webs. A mangrove forest or swamp is our fifth type of habitat found in the intertidal zone. Um, so a mangrove forest is these big trees and they have these really gnarly kind of roots that all kind of crisscross all over the place. Um, and they'd be really hard to, to swim around if you got caught up in that area. Um, but they do a good job of protecting the soil um, and the banks from the water because they break wind and waves um, before they get to the shore. So it kind of prevents a lot of soil erosion and sediment from getting into the water and causing a lot of high turbidity. Um, so, and also these roots provide a good nursery for marine animals. Similar to the estuary, it gives um, grown organisms a nice place to maybe lay their eggs or grow their young where they're protected from predators or from the harsh environment that might be out in the ocean. Um, this is Mrs. Owens, an example of Mrs. Owens when she went to visit a mangrove forest and she's holding up a big old sea star that she found in that area. Okay, so this is the last part of the intertidal zone notes. Um, just be sure that you add in on the left here, this is what you should be writing there. Living in the intertidal zone, organisms must tolerate a variety of environmental factors. And we kind of mentioned these on the first slide. So waves are definitely number one. Um, again, as that water comes in at high tide, the water is all the way up here and all of these organisms would be underwater. But when the tide comes in, the water doesn't come in nicely. It's gonna crash in and um, put a lot of pressure um, and friction and stuff on all of these organisms trying to cling to the rocks. We have a lot of changes in salinity, so changes in the amount of salt that is in the water. Again, because of evaporation um, or flooding, all of that kind of stuff can cause the salt in the water to go up and down. The temperature of the water here, because the water is shallow, especially if it's in a tide pool, the temperature is going to change a lot because when we have shallow water, the sun's going to heat that water up um, a lot. Then we have the water. So organisms up here, especially at the top in the rocky shore kind of area, they need to, they will be exposed to water sometimes, but a lot of times they're going to be exposed to air. So they need to be able to handle both. Same thing for these organisms down here. As you go closer or further down into the lower tide areas, most of these organisms are going to experience a lot more water than they do air. But still, they're going to have to tolerate both. All right, guys, I think that will be it. Make sure that you check out on page 10 your estuary picture and answer the questions that go along with that. Thanks for watching.